Welcome to the third episode of the Arcangelo podcast. I'm Arcangelo's General Manager, Julian Forbes, and I'm pleased to be once again premiering this episode to Arcangelo's closest friends and supporters via our private online members lounge. If you missed episodes one and two, featuring guests Kate Lindsay and Yestin Davies, you can now find them, the episodes, that is, not Kate and Yestin, on general release on Arcangelo's YouTube channel. Our guest for this episode is a very familiar sight to Arcangelo supporters and a favourite sight to many. He's always seated right at the front of the stage, one leg crossed carefully over the other. He barely refers to the booklet in front of him and is always visibly engrossed in and attentive to the music making around him. That rather makes him sound like a very privileged audience member bearing a super access concert ticket. But I'm referring, of course, to lutenist Thomas Dunford. Thomas, welcome to the podcast. And without wanting to dispel your mystique, I'd like to invite you to start by telling us something of your personal and musical background. Who are you and where do you come from? So it all started with my father, who was an American cellist, and started being obsessed with the viol, uh, and Jordi Savard in particular. But in the 1980s, nobody really knew who Jordi Savard was before he did all his Tous les Matins du Monde, the Marais Marais uh, recordings. And, and but my father was listening obsessively to the viol and started playing the violin in New York, which was the odd thing to do. And so he decided to cross the Atlantic Ocean, go to Switzerland, and study with Jordi Savard, who was his hero. And there he met my mother, who was also a student. And uh, they started playing together and making children together. <laughs> And so my sister and I grew up in this uh, Baroque family, you know, and my sister and I would always like uh, <laughs> find the parents to be dorky, dorky Baroque musicians. But we, um, I, I, anyway, I started uh, playing the lute, following them at a workshop. I remember they, they gave us le- viol lessons when we were kids, but it was really pu- more of a punishment than anything else. But uh, on a full size viol, I guess there, there were no child viols lying around. Oh no, it was on, on t- tiny viols. Actually, my sister was pretty good until she she broke my mother's bow, and that was the well, maybe one of the only moments my mother got mad. So I think that's what traumatized her with baroque music even uh. more. <laughs> but she ended up uh, having a kid with a harpsichord player. So. Okay. That's funny. Anyway, so I I, I was playing uh, since I was a baby. Basically, I was was always ukuleleing or plucking strings. Uh, okay, so you had your first plucked instrument was in fact a ukulele. i yeah, I have this tiny ukulele. I always played it since I was a kid, and uh, and then I played guitar a little bit, but nothing too fancy. Just some good old Beatles tune, rock and roll, and uh, and maybe uh, Jeux Interdits. That one. And then I was at a workshop with my parents that my parents gave. They said, "You look bored. Why don't you, why don't you pick up an instrument?" And there was a wonderful lute teacher there called Claire Antonini. And I remember my first lesson with her with this tiny lute. It was uh, Bergamasca, just ding 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 ding. Just that, and then we did a bit, uh, worked on it for an hour together. It was a really nice sensation because it was very smooth sound, lute, and very resonant. And it was a bit like falling in love, but with an instrument. <laughs> Strange. And then we started, and then I played the first little concert uh, right after that with the students. It was easy, and I just kept on playing the lute. Just kept on playing and studied the conservatory. Um, so I could go to school only in the morning. That was great. And conservatory in the afternoon. And then uh, my first professional concert was playing. Uh, they asked me when I was about 14 to start this show at La Comédie Française, uh, Twelfth Night by Shakespeare, where they wanted a, a young lute, uh, kid lute player to be the soundtrack of, of the show. That cue of lutes playing teenagers must have stretched around several blocks, surely. Uh, yeah, that's an, actually I was I think I was the only kid lute player that at the time. So I just came back from school and my parents said, 
we have great news. The conservatory person says they want you to go and play at La Comédie Française. Oh, yeah, cool, let's do that. <laughs> and so I, I played my favorite music, which was Dowland, which is basically had, has been my Bible for uh, since I started playing the lute. And uh, and so I so we worked with a staging director on J. I forgot his last name to to find the right pieces for the show. And then we with Guillaume Gallien, who was the so he was playing the fool, and I was basically always with him with a little fire, uh, a little fire that I was always carrying around to yeah. burn my lute. I almost burned the Comédie Française one 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 evening. <laughs> And so he was singing for my tears in French, <laughs> but very well. And uh, it was great because I, I would get to invite all my teachers that I was not always following during lessons because at school I was more reading books than actually listening to what was going on. And so I invited my teachers and they always gave me good grades because uh, <laughs> because they were happy to come to La Comédie Française. And, uh, and that's how it all started. And little by little, uh, when I was about 16, I started playing with Pygmalion, a French group that just started with a bunch of uh, young French guys. And then more and more Baroque groups. And when did you first meet and work with Johnny? I think that was about, wait a minute. Uh, so 2011 was Atis. I think it was in two, about 10 years ago, maybe. And we were playing in, um, basically Johnny had heard of of me through Erin Headley that I I never met, but apparently she said she liked what I did. And she recommended that I come and play with Les Arts Florissants, where that Johnny was conducting in the time. And we there was uh, we met with Chris Purves and Christian Card singing uh Achi Galate in Poly Fermo. Okay. Really nice piece. And uh yeah, it was great. <laughs> we became friends instantly. It was really nice. <laughs> Just like to stick with your musical education for a little longer. How long were you at the conservatoire and where did you go after you'd finished? Yeah, so from uh, from the moment I started till 18, I was in the conservatory in Paris, mm -hmm. Paris Conservatory. To, uh, so it was uh, four hours of, of normal school in the morning and then the e afternoons for conservatory lessons or jamming with my jazz player friends who taught me jazz in, in parks. And then when I was 18, I had to decide where to go. So I, I, I uh, my parents recommended I go to Basel where they had studied themselves. Which is very international. And then I met Hopkinson Smith, oh. who was my teacher for three years. And he was very much like uh, my Indian guru. He was a bit like a father figure in, uh, in music and wonderful teacher, great human being. He's actually, I had great teachers before. But Hoppy was uh, the one who really taught me how to work, how to really not let go until you get what you want. The phrase over and over again, over and over again, until you get the right thing. It was a wonderful experience working with Hoppy. I exclaimed back there at the mention of Hopkinson Smith, and for any lute player, he is an instantly legendary figure, but perhaps for the non-lutinist listeners you could just explain why studying with him was such a big deal well hopkinson smith is i think one of the most uh, influential lutinists of the 20th century he basically he's one of the lutinists who revisited uh, all this music at a very high level the most and he there was Julian Bream before there was that, that generation, but the generation that followed with Pollard and Hopkinson Smith, uh, those guys had a huge impact on the lute because they really rediscovered the instrument, the repertoire, and they Hoppy as well is a great teacher. So he he influenced a generation of uh, guitar players, people from Argentina, from all over the world came to his classes. And now most of the lute players we know today that are uh, wonderful. It's a lot thanks to uh, to Hopkinson Smith. He he's done a wonderful work, a job for the lute. Yeah. I'm just imagining the first lesson that you'd have had with Hoppy, this young guy who's already been on stage at the Comédie Française, coming face to face with the the old master at the the college in Basel. Did you have an instant easy rapport, or was there an element from him of? Uh, now look, young man, enough of all this larking around. It's time to get serious with me. 
there's there was a, a bit of both. It was really like having a, a father who cared for you, but who saw you, you were a too exuberant because I was, the problem I had during my studies is I was professionally playing at the same time, but the conservatories such as Basel believed the best way to do was actually stay there and study there and be in the library and be very rigorous. But actually, I'm glad I did what I did because I learned more going to work with English, Irish, uh, French, Belgian, Spanish groups because I, I, I had so many different perspectives. Hoppy was, um, Hoppy taught me how to be rigorous because he saw that I was, uh, I had a lot of ideas and was creative and, uh, but he, he, he taught me how to basically, uh, how would you say, put that into order a little bit. Hmm. So he, he was, uh, okay, that's great. <laughs> that's nice. But get to the get to the point to the deep point okay. so okay i would i would play and be happy and try different things and just improvise and hobby would say okay back from the start and then we'd start six notes in the farewell by downland da, 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 da. just those uh -huh. but we're just un, until we get those six notes absolutely perfect would get back the first note no back to the start oh wow so and th that's the rigor that i needed and actually in in some moments it was a bit frustrating because i just wanted to play but hoppy did the right thing and now i can only thank him because every time i work i think he's still there a little bit what was the uh, what was his intention with getting you to do those repetitions what was what was he wanting you to change or to focus on well the thing is, if things are easy for you, you just tend to do it and you don't really think about it. So you don't really get better so much better because you're always, you do things the way they come. And that's the way I was, but he taught me how to push farther, how to do the same thing, but actually think about it. How to, the intellectual side of music, which is actually something important that you think about the music that you know where it's going, uh, how the fingers should move and all those practical things that are very important. Uh, Hoppy was uh, greatly responsible for, for that for me. Time to bring things back to the present, at least the present as we remember it from live concert halls and as I hope we're returning to very soon. Many of our supporters understand that you are part of the Continuo section in Arcangelo and other groups but they might not have a full understanding of just what Continuo is, if it's possible to describe it in a nutshell in a forum like this. What is Continuo, Thomas Dunford? <laughs> so Continuo, what is Continuo? Continuo is uh, what uh, jazz pianists and guitarists would be in a Baroque uh, style, which means that Continue is a particular type of, of uh, job as a musician because you, most people have a written line. Continue players have a bass line and actually the best thing to have is the, the whole score in front of your eyes so that you know where the music's going. And uh, you have to invent something with it. If you're alone on the bass line, of course you'd have to play the bass line. If you have a cellist, which is most of the time what happens, a cellist and maybe a harpsichord player playing the, those lines, then it's all about filling in what's, what's happening. And so you need to have a very precise uh, understanding of the music, the composition, uh, so that you find the right, uh, the right things to do, the right things to invent. It's a very fun thing to do because you, when you get it right, you're happy. But it's, it, it's, since it's improvised, you, you never know. But the more you try things, the better you get at getting things right. You so need to fail in order to improve. You're not listening, you're not reading music so much as listening to it. Yes, actually, it's, uh, I think it's just like everything in life. In order to, for something to become really good and natural, it needs to be assimilated. So you need rules. And you need those rules, just like we're having this conversation right now. We're not thinking necessarily about every single syllable that's coming out of our mouths. Mm -hmm. But we're, the, the English language has been assimilated so that we can uh, naturally express ourselves. And I think in music, it's just the same thing. It means you need to 
work on the skills uh, to be able to technically play the notes and also know where the harmonies go. But then once it becomes natural, you don't have to think about it. It's just about, and actually by not thinking about it, you're more in the moment and being more in the moment makes the music more impactful. So you're re if you, the reading is just a way, uh, it's like if you're memorizing a text, that's the best way to say it because you, an actor will uh, recite sh Shakespeare better after having lived through it and not reading it because then it will become his, his own text. And I think as a musician, you need to do that, especially as a continual player. You need to absolutely know what's going on so that you can invent because you have to be at the you have to be at the level try to aim for the level of the composition and when you're you're aiming to to compose with bach or with handel it's a very very high level that many of the great composers themselves they had the music already finished in their heads the last thing they could be bothered to do was to write it all out they got a copyist to to finish it off if they even finished it off at all right yeah, exactly. I think uh, if you look at Bach, he was even more known as an improviser, as a composer. Uh, in the time, they would all fear Bach's uh, improvisation skills. Louis Marchand, the greatest uh, improviser of his time in France, came for a competition in a church where Bach was uh, practicing. Uh, when he heard Bach practice on the organ, he, he fleed in fear. Everything you've been saying here about continuo and composing with Bach and Handel uh, and all the rest of it makes it really clear to me that for you the music I said at the start that you barely seem to refer to the score um, it's worth saying isn't it for our listeners that the score the the printed material that we get from the archives and the libraries and revere to a certain extent it, it really does not contain the whole truth about this music does it or, or even a fragment of it that's the thing is, it's hard. If we'd, if we'd uh, not listen to the Beatles for three centuries and would play the Beatles in 2300, we'd probably look at the scores and look at... Now, let's imagine we don't, we, the recordings and, and videos are all gone in 2300. That's exactly what we're doing now. We'd, we'd actually look at the scores of the Beatles, know they were eminent musicians of the 20th century, and would be very careful about doing the right thing and playing exactly in time and being very proper, but it's then it's not alive anymore. And that's the thing that we tend to do with the classical music is we, we want to do a good job because we know that they're wonderful. We have the proof of their music that it's wonderful music. But in order for it to be really great, it needs to be fully natural. It needs to be uh, extremely natural. And, th and those codes of playing, very subtle things, the rhythm being here or here, but before or after, the shaping of things. That's something you can't really write in the score. It's something that's part of, uh, it's just like accents. Mm -hmm. Like in England, there are so many types of accents that have evolved. Yeah. And uh, in our way of playing the music, it's the same thing, but we need to accept there are, there are accents that are there. If we deny that, then we deny music. Do you think this dependence on the score or this um, deference to the score is just a problem in Baroque music, in early music, or does it go further? I think we all tend to, to, to do that. Uh, in classical music, I mean, there are, um, it, it's very interesting to hear Rachmaninoff play his own music and then hear Rachmaninoff play by other players or the great composers do their own thing because there's something extremely natural, maybe not so technically impressive, but there's something extremely natural about it. And, um, and I think it's, we all tend to do that. We all have to be, get away from that of, music is all about creating as much uh, powerful emotions for people as, as possible. And, uh, and that happens in a gesture, I think it's a, uh, it's a gesture. And if you, if you don't allow the gesture, then the music won't have its power. And sometimes a gesture that has the wrong technique is more important than a perfect technique that doesn't have the gesture. And uh, that, that's a tricky thing because in order to, to do the right gesture, you need to be sensitive to harmonies that are 300 years old. And that's yeah. the tricky thing. 
A jazz player will play with no problem Henry Purcell, but he will not necessarily, for him it will be just a little bland. The harmonies will be a little flat because he's used to such crazy harmonies. We need to get back to what, what it meant for Purcell at the time in order to make, to find the right balance. Coming back to the stage once more, you travel and collaborate with new people all the time. How quickly do you understand the wavelength? How quickly do you get the measure of a collaborator when you meet them for the first time? How long does it take you to establish that essential rapport? Well, it's pretty much instant, I think. The moment it's actually, if you're, if you're really open to what's going on, the instant you hear someone sing, or play you it's it's the best way of knowing the person i think music the way we play is the way we are and in in a i think in a very short time in a couple of seconds if you really pay attention to what's going on then you know how the person is is working is he being open is he being uh intellectual uh is he very proper or is he more extravagant? Um, music says a lot, I think. Actually, it's the best way to know someone, uh, I think. It's a, it's the best language that exists because it's very pure. It just uh, So the, the, the moment where you meet someone through music, you kind of know, know the person almost instantly. So the moments when I play the first notes with the, some of my favorite uh, people to play with, I just I just knew it was going to be a, a long story and mm. it, it ended up being yeah the moment where I met Johnny it was an instant as well we just we just clicked we are getting towards the end of this podcast but before we wind up please tell everybody about your own ensemble ensemble jupiter where did that come from and what are you hoping to achieve with that group uh, it was a natural thing. It came from experience. From the very start, I always had a very powerful th- feeling about music. But uh, and little by little, I, I, I made some friends, and I also learned a lot from different people, from different people I had worked with. I ended up having my own ideas about uh, how to make the music come alive as much as possible. So for me, the key was after experience. The best thing is have the best ingredients possible. So top musicians that have very, very skilled technically in a way that don't have to think anymore. They don't have to, to intellectualize anything anymore. They can just play and listen to what's going on. So that's a very important thing to have because the music that we play, even till the time of Mozart, was not actually conducted the way we do it now. Uh, even though a conductor is a great thing to get things to go uh, quite far in a very short time, which is <laughs> great in COVID times with no money for rehearsals and all these things. You need a conductor to get far in, in a short time. But actually the best way for this music to sound is that every single player in the ensemble becomes uh, a composer in a way that I would, if you play Monteverdi, Purcell, or even Mozart, I would see those musicians back at the time where they were doing their music Mozart, you can see it in his museum. He was playing pianoforte and all his musicians were around him. And he was a bit, a bit like a pop star because he could sing every role and play the piano. And then the musicians already knew that you had to play in time or they knew the shaping of harmonies from the time. But uh, Mozart, all he would do was actually just express what he meant in the music to his musicians and what, what, what the emotional impact of music had. And I think that's the way to work on this music. That's the way to get the music to its highest level. Mm. It means uh, conducting is great, but it's an intellectual way of uh, transmitting an emotion to people because then there will be one movement that will direct a human emotion of the player, Well, which is a way to do it, but actually players knowing how things have to be done and reacting to the uh, to each other that creates something extremely natural in the music making 
And I think that's that's what I want to do with Jupiter. I didn't do Jupiter because it was the easy thing to do, especially in these times. Having a group is is a difficult thing to to do. But it was more of a need to to go as far as possible mm. with the music to really make it uh, very powerful, so that it can it can move people and and maybe bring a bit of uh, elevation to to people. Well, we are going to wind this up, but we will do that with uh, what's now becoming an early tradition, which is to ask our guest to name a favourite album. Uh, in your case, Thomas, what was your favourite album growing up? Um, the White Album, uh, I think. That was, yeah, I, was it the White Album my, or Revolver? I, I don't remember which one it was. It was the Beatles album my, my uncle gave me. And what about the Desert Island album, the one's takeaway to listen to again and again and again? Kind of blue, maybe. The, um, that's a good one. And also, I like uh, very much this fat uh, uh, Hawaiian ukulele player called uh, Israel Kawaki Moabe. I can't, can't really remember his last uh, name. But that's a nice one to listen to in an island. Kamakawi Wole. Kamakawi Wole. He well, sings over the rainbow with a ukulele, beautiful voice and uh, just happiness. I don't know. There's uh, so many great albums. It's hard to, yeah. to choose, but uh, I think I probably should listen to, get prepared and listen to all the Bach stuff to find the right Bach, uh, maybe B minor mass to, to bring, bring on a, on a, on a I'm sure there's, I'm sure there's one by Archangelo somewhere, but I wouldn't, I there wouldn't. you go. An Archangelo B minor <laughs> mass would be perfect. <laughs> Well, there we are. We've reached the end of this third episode of the Archangelo podcast, so it only remains to thank all of you very much for listening and to thank our guest, Thomas Stanford. Thank you. Well, thank you for inviting me. It was fun. Take care.